Seventh inning here, the Angels go back into the bullpen once again. Yeah, Ty Butchery coming into the game. He's got good numbers. Strikeout pitcher, 38 and two-thirds innings, 47 strikeouts, only 11 walks. Pumps the first pass for those strikeout oh, arms you're talking there. about, CJ, in the Angel bullpen. Yeah, this guy has worked out really well. Traded for Ian Kinsler a year ago for the Boston. Certainly could have used a guy like Ty Butchery. Yeah, you can. everybody can use a guy like Ty Butchery. So go ahead, Eric. Take it from that awesome announcer. Oh, man. Well, I don't know how I can top that, but we welcome in a man who isn't afraid to be himself. A former MLB pitcher who had eight wins and 11 saves in three seasons. He is now the co-founder of Drip Social, where him and Sam talk NFTs, personal growth, and seltzer slash pickle reviews. We can call him a friend of the show because this is his second time coming on. We welcome in Ty Buttry. What's going on? What's going on, Eric and David? Thanks for having me, man. Um, yeah, CEO, you know, CEO of Drip Social. I don't even know. Honestly, I don't even know what Sam and I are doing. We're doing seltzer reviews. We're doing pickle reviews. We're talking NFTs, personal growth. We're jumping in, you know, cold tubs and red lights. So we're just, you know, we're living life, man. We're, we're living our passions. We're, uh, we're trying to build something. But no, man, I appreciate you guys having me on. This is cool to be here uh, for the second time. Ty, so I have a question before Eric jumps in here. Uh, <laughs> I did not do enough of my homework on you, so I need to ask. The, the seltzer reviews, are they like alcoholic seltzer reviews? Yes, they are. So wait, have you had high noons yet? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes. I'm a big I, I'm a big fan of the high noon. I think um, I would have I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy about it's a pretty like strong. It's a pretty strong flavor, man. Like I, I actually kind of Sam loves them. Um, I'm not a big fan of the vodka and like the hard, hard seltzers. Like I just I like more of like the malt liquor, like, you know, the White Claws, the Trulies, the Funky Buddhas. Um, Funky but, you Buddhas, know, I mean, everyone's doing their own thing with seltzers now. So it is what it is. Man, that's that's a dagger to my heart, Ty. Man, David, yeah, they, I, I, right, man. I, Gotta be are honest. you not getting sponsored by High Noon yet? You talk about them every occasion you can. I mean, if it's fed to me like this, I mean, I have to ask. So, but <laughs> I, I respect Ty's opinion. So, Ty, last time we spoke, it was prior to the pandemic shortened season. How was playing through that? Uh, it was one of the worst things I've ever been a part of. Absolutely terrible. Um, and I, I know that's pretty like direct and harsh, but it's the truth, man. It's whenever there's no fans in baseball, I didn't realize that's, you know, I'm doing a lot of reflecting and kind of gathering some different perspective, you, you know, now being four months out of the game. And like, that's really when things for me started to change, you know, when we had to show up to the field every day and I, you know, obviously we had to follow protocol. I'm not going to sit there and go down that path, but man, it's just as like, for me, the fans, like, that's why I, I love doing social media. Like, I loved even before now. Like, I was always trying to stay engaged. I was always trying to break down that barrier between the athlete and the fan. I think um, I think that's very important in sports to have that open, you know, relationship. And obviously, there are some fans out there that may take advantage of that. But I think, I think you know, we do this for the fans. We do this for people that enjoy it. You know, they paid the bills. I mean, ultimately, that's who pays our bills and pays our these big salaries. And so when uh, COVID happened, man, and fans were ripped out of there, you know, what was left? I mean, it was a game of baseball, which, you know, no cheering. You have fake, you know, stadium noise. The you have cutout the fans. Cut, the cutouts, like you're trying to get jacked up. You're trying to play for something bigger. It's like, it just, to me, it wasn't baseball, but it was the situation it was. And, there's nothing we could do about it. And fortunately, the Angels didn't have any huge outbreaks like we saw the Nationals and the Cardinals have where you know, games were postponed and they had a lot of double headers. What was kind of the motivational tactics that they used? Obviously, in a 60-game season, expanded playoffs, everything carries a little bit more relevancy. Each game's a little bit more important. But without the fans there, you're right. That's a huge kind of element that you're missing, especially at home. What did they try to do to get you, you know, excited for each game and, and motivated and ready to play? The same thing that we were doing, you know, in prior years. I mean, that's and that's where I think we kind of I think everything kind of fell short. But I'm not going to throw blame because it was the first time something like this happened. So no one had any plan. No one had any real idea. We all were just trying to 
not lose players for COVID. You know, you, you lose a player, it the whole thing gets thrown out of whack. Um, and it just is like, it just was a very, it was just a hard situation, man. But like to get motivated, like that's literally like, so for me, like my favorite, my biggest moments were in big time situations. A lot of fans screaming at me, like I thrived off that. And so that's why it was so tough for me to continue to stay motivated. Like I remember many times being called to go in a pitch to close and like, I'm drinking Red Bulls. Like I'm trying to get myself, like I'm doing like fast breathing to get my heart rate up. I'm doing like sprints in the bullpen, you know, just to get some type of adrenaline. And then you run in there and it's just quiet. And you're like, what is this? Like, this is like back, you know, you know, in the, in the spring training fields, you know, like, this isn't baseball. Like this isn't what I wanted to do. And that's when like, I started really reflecting and thinking about it. Um, and yeah, man, I just, you didn't really do anything for, I mean, it had to come from within. And unfortunately for me, I had a hard time creating that motivation without the fan base. Yeah. And so Ty kind of building off of that, uh, you're one of, obviously again, one of the, the guys we talked to, one of the first guys we actually talked to about a year ago, and we all had to like double check our phones when we were like, wait, Ty Butchery retired? Like what? Like what happened? And uh, you made kind of uh, some ripple effects with that on April 4th. Some things cited you as saying you lost your love for the game, that uh, you kept playing to prove everyone wrong, but also that you were tired of pretending. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I was tired of pretending because ultimately, you know, as baseball players or as athletes, um, we have to go out there and we have to wear that that uniform as an athlete everywhere we go. And that comes with sacrifices that comes with, you know, not doing certain things on maybe social media or maybe not starting um, other side businesses or maybe, you know, or even going into the fans like, you know, having to sit there and put on smiles when you're not really happy with your situation. And that's kind of when COVID happened and we came back this year. And there still wasn't fans there. And there was just like, to me, it was just like this fake, like it was this fake culture. It's like, why are we acting like we are all sitting here and everything's normal? Like to me, it's not normal. You know, we have 25% capacity. Um, we're still sitting, you know, I, we still can't really interact with the fans. We, it's still this weird, like barrier up. Um, and that's when like, I started really kind of reflecting like, okay, why am I playing this game? You know, it like, why am I, thinking back, like, why did I spend all those, you know, six years in the minor leagues, um, those long bus rides, being away from my family. And that's when I started like really reflecting on my goals. And like, it was always about money, man. It was always about wanting to get, you know, three for 10 million. I mean, I literally in my head from the time I was a young kid, like I wanted to be a baseball player because I was big and strong and everyone told me how hard I was going to throw and how good I am. And you kind of start believing that stuff. You know, you start believing when you're a young kid, wow, I am tall. I am big. I can throw a ball hard. I'm a good athlete. And oh my gosh, I can make $50 million doing this. And like what young kid, I said that in the article, like what young kid doesn't want to have a cool job that pays really well. Um, but like going back as my childhood, like I loved hitting, I love like playing the outfield. Um, I love being part of the team and pitching, you know, to me, baseball is kind of two sports. You got pitching, you got hitting. And, um, you know, I'm not going to say I would rather have been like a hitter, but like to me, I'm pretending because I'm doing it for selfish reasons. Like I'm doing it for making money, man. And like, that's, I trust me, we're all, I get that we're all in life to make money. We all want to have success. We all want to have a little bit of fame. We all want to make money, but I made the money. I had the fame and I still was unhappy. And to me, that was a big red, big, big red flag that that feeling was never going to go away. And taking all that time away from my wife and my family and then not having the fans with COVID. Um, it just, it was like, I'm tired. Like, you know what, man, I'm tired of pretending like during that COVID break guys, like my wife and I spent that time in that RV. We did some of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. Um, we had the most fun. It was the best our marriage ever was. We were in a 350 square foot little steel, you know, RV box and the happiest I've ever been in my life and insert baseball again. And all of a sudden I'm kind of, you know, I get that anxiety feeling. I'm like, 
this there's something here and that's you know that personal growth stuff i've t i've talked about the meditation all those things i've done to get clarity in my life um that's what it was kind of revealed so i know that's a long long answer but no, I, I think it's a great answer. And hopefully you showed up that teacher that said that you weren't going to make it to the MLB. I read yeah, that in an article yeah. as well. The, uh, the RV, uh, isn't that named Thor Outlaw? I think I read. Yeah, the Thor Outlaw. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. We still have it. I'm actually trying to dump that thing. I need to I need to try to sell it. But Sam and I want to take a couple more trips in it. So we'll see. You remember that's that's the first time we talked with you. You were going on a camping trip in your RV yep. and you went in there. And you're yep. like, yeah, guys, I'm on the road in the RV. Let's do this thing. I know. I know. Sure. So, so Ty, obviously, you know, it sounds like retirement had been on your mind for a little bit. Was there anything about baseball that was drawing you back in that you said, you know, maybe I'll, I'll put up with it for one more year. Maybe I'll try to get paid. You know, maybe it's hard for me to leave the clubhouse and the fraternity that I've been in my entire life. Was there anything that really kind of drew you back? So I will say when I first made the decision, I was pretty emotional about it. But I also, for the most part, believed in that decision a hundred percent. Um, and I was good, man, for about like a month, two months. Like I was like, there was no part of me that wants to go back at all, you know? And I will say when I saw Texas being the first stadium to be full capacity and I saw, you know, all those fans there, I literally like, I didn't have a panic attack. I just was like, Whoa. I was like, that, like that moment, like literally crept back in my head of like, Oh my gosh, like that's 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 baseball right there. Like that's what baseball is. And then seeing Angel Stadium, you know, fill up again, I kind of like started to be like, man, like that would be so cool to like get back in there, like running in with that adrenaline, having that natural motivation from the fans and you know the atmosphere. But then like you know that was like that that's what kept me playing. And that's what kind of kept me in into me like that hamster wheel. Um, not in a bad way. It just was like, all right, this, like I'm doing this for the fans and I'm doing this and I'm not doing this for Ty. And that's when I said, like, I'm tired of pretending like I love the fans. I, I like, they're the ones who kept me playing, kept me working hard. But like, when I said, like, I'm tired of pretending it's like, am I doing this for Ty? Like, does Ty really want to win, you know, become an all-star? No. Like, does Ty want to win a World Series? Yeah, hell yeah. Like, that'd be cool. Like, I, I would love to win a World Series. But, like, is it in my heart and soul that I want to go out there and, like, you know, it, and, like, I just started questioning my intention. And I'm like, okay, so you're going to be you're going to be at the baseball field for 11 hours a day, over 200 days out of the year. You're going to have a long distance relationship again with your wife. You're not going to be able to pursue other passions of building and doing real estate and investing and you know, social media. Um, and that's kind of like that athlete identity, you know, that athlete identity is like, listen, you're a baseball player. Like obviously Trevor Bauer went against the grain and um, he's in his own world right now doing what he has, you know, taking care of that. But like, you don't really see too many athletes having these side hustles. And to me, I think that's, I think that needs to be more popular, man. I think, you know, it gives athletes another identity outside of just being, a, um, you know, when you're at the field, you're at the field, you're, you're in that uniform you represent the club. Obviously you represent the club and the fan base everywhere you go, but like I wanted to, I just want to do other stuff, man. So, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of what I got. Do teams dislike when you have a side hustle? Do they feel like you're not fully committed to baseball if you're exploring other opportunities? They'll, uh, depends on who you are. If you're kind of like a big dog, you know, you got some power, you got some uh, money, you got some years, you're a veteran. Uh, it's nothing really they, they can say if you're a one to four year guy and you're kind of a rookie. Um, yeah, like hell yeah. Like it's definitely not, you know, they want you focused. But that's the thing. It's like the more I focused on other issues or other hustles, like the better I was at baseball. Like when I was just focused on baseball, like I, I couldn't do that. Like I just didn't want any part of the game when I was only focused on baseball because I put so much hard work into the game already that like I was already focused on it so much. I needed other outlets. And so like, yeah, like teams, teams definitely, you know, they're not going to flat out say like, no, you can't start a real estate side hustle. But like, if, you know, if you're not acting like you're focused on it 24 seven, then, you know, clearly that can kind of be an issue. 
So, Ty, one of the things that I want to talk about is the salary that MLB players and MILB players receive. And I think the average person thinks that everyone is millionaires based on the huge contracts we see for players like Fernando Tatis and Mike Trout. You know, obviously those are big amounts of money, but the majority of players don't receive that. And in late May, you made an Instagram post saying, quote, $2 an hour doesn't cut it, MLB. Minor league salary needs to elevate. Damn, I'm sorry. It may be closer to $4 an hour. It tagged MLB and MILB. I kind of want to give you the floor to expand on your thoughts. I mean, it's pretty simple. It's uh, minor league baseball players are part of this elite skill set, right? You know, when you get drafted, to just go and play on your har- your varsity baseball team is an accomplishment. Then to get and go play college baseball, that's another accomplishment. And then to get drafted and actually get paid money, which is nothing, that's now you're part of this elite skill set. You know, now you're part of this 1% of people in the world that can't, you know, that you can do something that other people can't. And so when I look at that and I kind of take that into account, I take into the account that, you know, 18 year old kids are taken out of high school some, you know, $200,000. If you're a high school kid, usually get a little bit more. Maybe it's 100K. Um, you know, college college players, 1000 bucks, 10000 bucks. But here's the thing. It's a, it's a seven-year contract, you know. Like, it's a seven-year contract. So that signing bonus, for me, I had a very cushiony, nice, comfortable signing bonus. And, you know, that it, – it made my time in the minor leagues – way way easier i was still on those bus rides i was still eating the same shitty food i saw everything that was going on and to me that lifestyle to be considered a prospect to be considered this one percent elite group and then you have the teams not paying you know for that for that salary because they don't have to because they have the control there's no minor league union there's no representation you know the players union is the one deciding and fighting for this. And they're obviously focused on the, the major league guys. Um, and when minor league guys get called up into the MLB, like myself, we shut up. I regret it to this day that I didn't talk more about that because I was afraid to kind of bite the hand that feeds me. And to me, it's just, it's unacceptable, man. It's something that you have guys, you know, in order to win, right. You want to take care of your investments. I'm telling you these owners, MLB has so much damn money, so much money that you guys, it's, it's unbelievable that if they wanted to fix the problem, they could do it just with like a, just with a snap, like, Hey, here you guys go. Here's 40 K take care of your family. You, you, you know, yes, they get healthcare. Like the, but the fact that I have to say, yes, they get healthcare. Like that's, that's where we're at right now. Like it's $10,000. Like these guys are getting 10, thousand dollars after taxes twelve thousand dollars before taxes to play six months out of the year man and it's like that's the season then you have two months of spring training and then you have to get sent down to extended spring training for another month and who knows maybe you go to a strength camp for another month so let's let's just like put this into perspective right you know a 10 uh a senior sign gets a thousand bucks He's got a girlfriend, you know, they get married. He's 24, 25. He wants to have kids. He wants to live life too. He wants to have another passion outside of baseball. So he has kids. Well, what if mom and dad can't take him in? Like mom and dad took me in, you know, like I, I had all this money and I still stayed with my mom and dad to save money. And it's like, you know, now he gets married, he has kids and because he's a senior sign, there's some, you know, politics involved with being called up. Maybe he's a great, you know, he, I, I've seen guys in AAA hit 300 every single year and they don't get a shot at the big leagues because they they got the prospects. It's backloaded. The team manipulates them just, to, just for one day. Maybe he hits 400 and he goes off for 40, you know, hits 30 home runs in AAA. Okay, then we'll call him up. But, like, you get these guys, man, that sacrifice, they – they've sacrificed everything their whole life, you know, from the time they were five years old, man, playing baseball. And now they're in a situation where it's like, Oh crap, like I can get to the MLB. But a lot of guys, we all know, then that's that other 1% jump, you know, from the 1%. And it's like, what's, what happens to those players, man, that are 27, 28, like 
where their life experience is, what skill sets, you know, life knowledge do they have to go back into life and to have a no, you know, that's what, like, have we ever w- wondered why so many baseball players just go back into coaching? Like, that's their only fallback because guys go back into coaching because they don't have college degrees or they don't have any other um, work experience. And so, hey, coaching, and then they start to grind all back over to then get up into the big leagues as a coach. It's like, dude, that's just such a toxic environment when you look at it like that, man. So I call out MLB um, because why the hell not? You know, like why not call them out? And because I think what you were saying is like people truly think that minor league players are rich. Like I not rich, but like they're comfortable. They're comfortable. Yeah. Very comfortable. Like, Hey, you're, you're a professional baseball player. You make a lot of money. Shut up sure. and play. Yeah, like shut, shut up and play. If you don't like it, play better. I've been literally, I've sat there. I've heard coaches say, if you don't like it, play better. And that's what I said in my Instagram reel. Well, how are you supposed to play better? Because in order to play better, you have to train in the off season, right? You have to go in and you have to spend time in the gym, hours at the field, working on your craft. But what if you have a family? What if you have a you know wife and kids that you need to provide? That's more that's more important than baseball. It just is taking care of your family is more important than baseball, hands down. So that means you have to get a job somewhere else. You spend hours doing a job that isn't benefiting you to work and play better. So it's like it's so it's just it's this control. It's this ultimate control that has been set up and the chain's never been broken and it's just, it's been a cycle. And that's where I think it's just, it's ridiculous to me. And that's why I call them out because so I, t- yeah. I was just going to say, I think that they do need to be called out. I'm wondering, I mean, like you said, they've had, they have so much money. I'm wondering if, Hey, like what, what can we do to meet in the middle here? Obviously there's a potential yeah. lockout that's looming, right? That everybody's been talking about that. And I think that's one of the first things the MLBPA, of course, is going to ask for, you know, the universal DH and they're going to ask for some, I think, things that are more surface level that people see. But I'm surprised that something like that would not be the at the forefront because so many baseball players are going to be more affected if they change the minor leagues before they focus on big league stuff. Do you feel like right. that that should be where they attack first when they're like uh, when they actually meet potentially this summer? I think I think the players union has an opportunity to kind of window win over the public. By putting the minor leagues first, I don't think they're going to because, like I said, there's no minor league representation. The Players Union is for the MLB. It's a prestigious honor to get to the MLB. It's even more of a prestigious honor to play multiple years, and then it's even more to play 10 years. And so we got to understand that, you know, the MLB, there's there's manipulation going on with there and, or in the, in, you know, at that level. And so to say, are they going to put this – issue forefront hell no no it's not it's definitely won't happen like that because you know what man and like like i said when when you're in the minor leagues you get up into the mlb and i did it firsthand i was like i did it i made it i worked my ass off i put in all that time and here i am and you just you get that you get that money you get that fame you get that attention and it's very, very hard to go back and reflect on all those times, all those, you know, those moments in the minors when you're like, damn, like you're thinking back, you know, you're looking at your buddies that don't have a nice signing bonus. You know, they don't have a nice family that they can go and hang out with and save money. You know, they don't have those luxuries. You forget about that stuff, man. So you're not going to fight for it because you're worried about you're worried about the team you're on. You're not worried about anything else. And that's why. There's a big saying, like, when I first got into Boston, it was beat into our heads. Not because of this, but because baseball is such a game where you can't control. Control what you can control. Like, worry about what you can worry about. Like, that's a huge philosophy in baseball that, like, a lot of players go by. You know, if you don't like it, play better. And so, like, that's the culture. And so, with that being the culture, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, I actually don't think there's really going to be much change with the union. I don't think the union is going to take it up. Um, I'm not calling out the union because I just think we're really early on this. And I think it's just at this point, we've seen um, courts shoot, you know, 
shoot down the pay. We've seen some things happen. And the loopholes usually, well, they're considered part-time. But, man, I'm telling you, minor league baseball is anything but part-time. It's That's the biggest BS. But that's how they've kind of been able to get away with paying these guys four bucks an hour because it's considered part-time work. It's like, come on, man. You know that you, these guys have three months in the offseason and their asses will be right back in the spring training, right under your little puppeteer control. So I don't think the um, – the new CBA is honestly going to be focused on the minor league pay whatsoever. It kind of sounds, it kind of sounds like the, the college basketball and football where it's like, Oh, Hey, you're a student first and an athlete second, but yet we can monetize and make millions and billions of dollars off NCAA sponsored events, the tournaments, their likeness and image. And we're kind of seeing a transition to that, but I want to talk about kind of what we saw with this past trade deadline. And it seems like people were either huge buyers or sellers and it seems like the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Padres going all in and the Nationals and Cubs sold players for pennies on the dollars. And, yeah. you know, we saw this in the offseason. The Rockies traded Nolan Arenado and $50 million to the Cardinals just to take them off their hands and to not have to pay the rest of that contract. So with no salary cap, a team's commitment seems based on how much these billionaire owners are willing to spend. And they're all billionaires. Oh, yeah, Does yeah. the does the owner's willingness to spend affect one's commitment to a team? Like if you're on the Rockies and you know, there's not a chance you're going to get paid. Do you think that kind of plays into your head a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's teams, you know, every, every, uh, we all know, we all know the organizations that are going to pay and we all know the organizations that aren't going to pay. And that's the manipulation. And that's what's going on. Like that's what the big league guys are fighting for. And that's why I'm saying like, there's so much manipulation like the minor leagues, like it's just like this is how big it is, like in terms of like where it is and the attention and like the priority list for the union to fight. Because like that, like what you just said, like teams can just be like, oh, we're going to use you for five years. You're going to give us some World Series. And then right before we're going to like, you know, give you that big money, we're going to ship you out and I'm going to save even more money. I'm going to hit my profit margins. I'm going to give my board of directors, you know, they're going to give me a pat on my back and everybody in the organization you know, the people that help me keep it under that salary cap, you're going to get the bonus. And it's like, that's where I said in that letter, it's like the game of baseball started to be more of a business than it did a game. And it's the reality, guys. I'm not sitting here saying that I'm, woe is me. I'm just calling out the perspective and the facts that I've seen. It's like, that's how the NFL is. That's how the NBA, like NBA is, they, you know, they do it right, but like to some degree, but like, man, like, Let's let's make this about the players. Let's make this about the fans. And if you get money from that, which you're going to get a lot of money from that, then I promise you, you're going to have a winning organization because everyone's going to be bought in. They're not going to be seeing manipulation going on. And I just I, I hate to see it, man. But like there's just so much BS going on at the top that these guys, it's like they can write a check like that. And, and but everyone, you know, it's an ego, man. Those billionaire owners, they have that ego. It's like, how can I? How can I cut? I mean, when teams are furloughing, think about that. Think like you want to put into perspective um, during COVID when teams are furloughing, like furloughing, like their staff, like for four months. So like, you know, the worker, the attendance people, the trainers. Nah, man, you're cut. We'll bring you back when we need you. You can go figure it out. You're not getting paid. It's like, what kind of business is that, man? Like to save 10 mil? to save eight mil when you have, come on, man. Like, don't tell me you're saving, like you're losing money. Like you got so much damn money. You just don't want to dip into that personal piggy bank. You're using the revenue from the tickets, the, the sales, you have stacks in that personal piggy bank, but you don't want to dip into that because that's, that's a hit on your ego and you're a businessman. You made that bill. It's making me upset, but you guys kind of see where I'm going with this. I got yeah, to I'm upset yeah. for you, man. I'm, I'm like, I, I never played a lick of baseball in my life, and I'm like yeah. upset. And, and and you know what's interesting is we talk about them furloughing staff, and it's like, I guess one of the great things about social media is people, you know, can can have news travel at a at a quicker thing. And I think of Josh Harris, the 76ers owner, when he furloughed staff last year, and somebody found out his net worth and called them out and said, you know, you're worth 4.3 billion, yet you can't pay 2.4 million. And it started this big wave and eventually he reversed the decision and said, Hey, look at, you know, it's, it's people brought to my attention, 
So I guess I wanted to ask, what would your solution be? I think you've brought up a lot of great ideas of, hey, look, yeah. you know, the owners just need to not be as frugal. They need to not have their ego. It doesn't sound like they're willing to change that anytime soon. Do you right. think star players need to speak out? Do you think ML MILB players need to go on strike? Do you need? Do you think they actually need to show videos of like the travel condition of the food they're eating? Like, what would your solution yeah. be to improve this problem? That's Eric. That's literally. Thank you for asking that, man. That's such a great point because, like, here's the thing: like, one, guys at the top need to speak up. They just do. They got to have. They got to. You know. You know. They have to speak up. I'm not mad at them. I'm not upset because that's not my battle. They can do whatever they want. They're the OGs. They're the veterans. They've been there. I'm in the peanut gallery right now. You got to understand. I'm the one that walked away. I'm kind of, you know, the black sheep. And so guys, guys at the top that have platforms can fix it like that too, if they really wanted to, but that's, that's a huge distraction from the season. I think that needs to be done in the off season, maybe in spring training. But the one thing you said is yes, Go check out minor league grinders on Instagram. That's a great way. Go check out and see what these guys are going through. They have 42,000 followers, and I think it's 42,000 minor league baseball players. And I say that because the public has no idea. The public literally, like, some somebody was saying, like, well, are somebody asked me, they're like, well, are you going to start trying to, like, really fix the problem? They're like, are you going to actually start, you know, doing something about it? And I'm like, listen, man, they've had court cases. They've had lawsuits. They've had these things. They've gone to owners. They've gone to farm directors. And it just gets hushed. It gets silenced because the masses doesn't care. The masses has no idea. That's why I keep talking about $12,000 before taxes, $4 an hour. Because that's something that anybody that has a heart and a soul can be like, wait a second, $10,000? Wait, wait, they're making $10,000? And that's like, that to me is like right now, the videos, you know, fundraisers, those are great. Getting the, getting the, um, you know, I want to start, I got a buddy who's halos in the infield. He's actually selling shirts at cost and he wants to give to catering. That's great. That's anything that's going to create attention that these guys are so underpaid. And, and somebody was like, well, what about the WNBA? What about teachers? And what about people just, you know, they know they knew what they signed up for signed up for. That's actually not true. They didn't know. I can promise you when these scouts are coming into your house in high school, they don't tell you they don't tell you that stuff purposely. But um, everyone's like, well, the WNBA is, you know, it's like, listen, guys, let's not get this twisted. I understand there's pay inequality going on around the whole entire world. I'm not fighting that battle. I have condolences and I, I support it. But I spent my time and I spent years and experience in this field. So I want to fight this battle because I see how messed up it is. I will support you in whatever battle that I think is the same. And but like 10, it's ten thousand dollars. Like it's not 30, it's not 25, it's not 40. It's it's teachers, yes, teachers, teachers are making minimum 25, 30, 40k. That's a joke. They're a teacher. I'm talking $10,000 and it's like, that's the issue. So raising that a point, bringing that awareness to the people like you guys, I, I just posted something. Um, a high, a high, a Mike, whatever big time prospect hit a grand slam. Uh, the lady in it won $10,000 and Jeff Passan, Passan, mm -hmm. Jeff, Jeff Passan, he was like, so let me get this right. That minor league, um, stadium can give ten thousand dollars away to a random fan, but that's a minor league player's whole entire salary. It's like you see kind of where it's like, like you you don't see you like you, you don't see that in the MLB. You don't see someone saying, "Oh my God, Mike Trout hit a home run. Here's four hundred and fifty million. You know, Ty Butchery had you know through a perfect inning. Here's six hundred thousand dollars to a perfect fan. No." But they're allowed to give ten grand away like that because it's nothing to them. It's nuts. That I mean, it's actually nuts. I mean, again, like, what do they expect you to? I mean, you're away from your families, right. and you're making nothing. So it's not like you're being able to support your families either. It's right. like, what's the what? So the only win is the possibility you get called up and you get a contract. But like you said, for the you know high percent of people that never make it to the major leagues, 
they're kind of left high and dry. And I think that's what most people really need to take dry. from this is, yeah. you know, the, the little salary they're making, but also the the burden it puts on their personal lives and the stress of trying to make money. And, and it, it just sounds awful. And I can't believe yeah. that MLB has let this carry on for this long. No one's, no one's going to fight it, man. So I guess that's, it's, it is awful. And um, it's on, it, it is to me, it's getting some more attention. I think some, I think, you know, Jeff Passan talking about it. Um, I'm trying to raise some awareness to it. Um, uh, MLB, uh, there's a Instagram page. They're doing some stuff. What's the, it, it's, I don't want to say it wrong. Let me look it up because there's like an underscore in it. I don't want to make sure. M, uh, oh, there more than, also, uh, minor more than baseball, too. MTB underscore org, more than baseball. Um, he's really doing some great stuff. But yeah, so you're starting to see minor leaguers like so that's kind of a, that's kind of a cool point is the generation, you know, this is a different generation of players coming up. And so social media, when I was playing like social media is just really like, re like everyone's using social media now businesses are going social media, everything's social. So people have voices now, you know, in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, 2010 to 2020, like. That's when you saw it, social media first come on the scene was the last 10 years. And people are like, whoa, what's social media? I hate it. I'm not going to put myself out there. But now people are like, oh, picture of a dead cricket in my hamburger. Yeah, I'm going to post that online. Like every single like, oh, I just got paid six hundred dollars for, you know, over 300 hours of work. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to tweet about that. And like people like the generation coming up. They grew up on social, so it's normal to them. And, and those kids, I think it's like Gen Y or whatever. Like, I'm not sure what the uh, the generation under me is, but like those guys are ruthless, man. They don't care. Like, they're savages. So they'll they'll call out they'll they'll call BS where they see it. Right? Yeah, and and I was gonna say, Ty, I think you know you mentioned Jeff bringing it to 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 people's attention, but you're being the pioneer for it as well. You know, not a lot of people are willing to walk away from the game they love, especially when they've reached the major leagues and have kind of finally gotten there and you know not everyone has a long career and some people want to milk the fame for as much as it's worth and I really commend and applaud you for speaking out for saying look there is life bigger than baseball I wasn't happy and I want to be Ty I don't want to be the baseball player and have that be my identity um I did tell you I did tell you that when you came back we were going to ask you a little bit more rapid fire those bullpen questions you still down for that a little this or that yeah, I'm down. I love it. All right. But <laughs> Would you if, rather? If you me to answer things quickly, which I'm very bad at. I like to give a long-winded answer. So it's, it's <laughs> practice, it's practice. No, no, you're fine. Would you rather throw over 100 miles an hour or hit over 100,000 Instagram followers? Whew. Tough one off the bat, right? <laughs> uh, well, Given my current situation, over a hundred thousand Instagram followers. There we go. I like it. We'll get you there. Did you ever yeah. get? Did you ever get to a hundred? I saw you like top that at ninety eight in one of your games. I hit a hundred of probably I think like six or seven times. I hit one hundred two in the fall league. Everyone hits one hundred two in the fall league, or everyone's throwing hard in the fall league for some reason. I think the guns are juiced, but no, I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was there was a couple games against the Red Sox in Seattle. I was at a hundred, but. Like, okay. That's why I said over a hundred. I figure you did hit a hundred a yeah. few times. Would you rather never get a paper cut again or never get anything stuck in your teeth again? Oh my gosh. Never get anything stuck in my teeth again. I hate that. Oh, <laughs> but those paper cuts hurt, man. Yeah. But just be more careful. It's like, you can't avoid getting stuff stuck in your teeth. It's you got to eat, man. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Would you rather be able to play 10 different instruments or speak 10 different languages? Speak 10 different languages. Okay. I like it. Yeah. Which one of these would you rather use for self-defense? A sword or nunchucks? Oh, um, is this considering I know how to use both of them or am I like? Yeah. Yeah. Nunchucks. Yeah. That'd be pretty badass, right? Yeah, that would be badass. I, I like that you asked, do I know how to use them? Because yeah. we all know how to use a sword. None of us yeah, know like how to use nunchucks. Swing, but like, if you know how to use nunchucks, you're, you know, K KO, dude. <laughs> would you rather have a hook for an arm or a peg for a leg hook for an arm okay all I right think that's cool. would you <laughs> rather forget who you were or who everyone else was i think i know your answer for this 
um, would I would I rather forget who I was or who ever, who everyone else everyone was? else was? Um, I would definitely rather forget who I was. Wow, I thought you were gonna go the opposite. Yeah. Okay, we got a few left. Would you rather find ten dollars on the ground? Wait, hold on, man. That question's like deep. That's not just a that's not just a rapid <laughs> question. Like, all like, right, all right. Let's open. Let's open it. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Like, can we talk about that for a second? Yeah. So, if I'm forgetting who I am, but like, I'll I'll know my wife. I'll know everyone. You'll know. Yeah, so, like, if you remember who you are, you know your Ty Butchery. You know your life. If you if you forget who everyone else is, it's like you know who you are, but it's kind of like amnesia when you see everybody else. Man, I got some good friends. I got some good family members. I got some good people in my life. I don't want to forget about them, man. I will. I will stick to that. I want to forget about myself. Wow, that is a, that's a good answer. That's a good I answer. Do. I just do. The next one isn't as deep. Would you rather find ten dollars on the ground or find all your missing socks? Well, considering I haven't worn socks in like the last two years. <laughs> you guys gotta remember i lived in an rv for 10 months man i was doing some we were out hiking i still i didn't train yeah i i got smelly feet it's a it's a surprise <laughs> you can use one utensil the rest of your life a fork spoon or knife which one are you picking you can't use a fork nope has to be one of those three definitely a fork Okay, that's yeah. the right answer. Yeah, it's you can yeah, you can do a lot with a fork. Yeah, you know, everybody says, oh, soup or cereal, like you can slurp cereal or you know you can have yeah. chunky soup. You can't replicate yeah. the fork. No, you can't. You need that. Okay. We got the last two here. Well, Eric, have... I, I do I do want to ask him at the end really quickly. Go ahead, and then there's something I have to show Ty real quick after you're done. Okay. Would you rather eat overcooked or undercooked food? Overcooked. 100%. Okay, so no no sushi for you? Um I'm not I like sushi. I'm not a fan of it. I just when you go undercooked, it's you're always running that risk of some little microbe that's not being killed off from the heat. And I hate getting sick. I hate throwing up. I hate stomach bugs. So I want to kill that shit. I want to make sure I'm good to go. I'd rather eat overcooked food. I'm now th th there's a little side uh tidbit did you ever throw up on the mound like we've seen adrian hauser throw up because he gets nervous did that ever happened to you in any game no i never threw up on the mound i had some i never got i had some anxiety for sure for baseball because i just it was like a dread just like i don't want to do this it wasn't nerves um never it was always like in, like my legs my limbs were kind of feeling weird but my stomach was always good Okay. All right. Uh, glad to hear that you didn't join the Adrian Hauser Club. <laughs> the last one we got here before David asks, would you rather constantly be tired no, how, no matter how much you sleep or constantly hungry no matter how much you eat? Whoa, that's hard. I say for last for a reason. Uh, definitely constantly hungry. I'm actually, I've read something that you can not eat food and these guys are literally not eating food and like they're um it's some stupid crap i probably read on instagram but like these guys <laughs> not for like months and they're like happy and they're healthy so uh being tired sucks yeah, oh, yeah. um so ty obviously we're we're trying we're a growing podcast we're you know trying to get to where we're trying to get to eventually hopefully full time one day there is a more established podcast going by the uh, the CBS Fantasy Baseball Today podcast. Had you heard of them by chance? The CBS Fantasy Today podcast? The CBS Fantasy Baseball Today podcast. I uh, have not. Maybe. Okay, so they're they're the CBS, you know, fantasy baseball equivalent. Uh, so obviously we're kind of independent there, the CBS podcast. And okay. You were uh you were one of the things that they had on their show for a little bit. Like one of one of the guys named Scott White uh, he does a, uh, a Michael Caine impression when talking about you because of your last name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know they've, they've done it before. They did it when you retired. They did an, an homage to it. I just wondered if you had heard it, but I was going to play it for you so you could get a reaction to it for the first time. All right. Let's see what they got. People that are talking in the YouTube chat right now, they're 
They're talking well, about potentially dropping. The, uh, make sure I have my volume up here. Unmute this. Here we go. Andrew Vaughn for Nate Love. And yeah. Vaughn actually. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm going to have to find this. Uh, right. Jose Quintana and Luis. It's supposed to be right Canta here. And said to the young man. Oh, here yes. we go. And yeah, he, is, he is awesome. Scott, Ty Butchery, man. I don't know if you have any you have any feelings about Ty Butchery. Uh, it's pretty late in the podcast. If you have oh. anything you'd like to say about him, you can do it today. If you want to save it for tomorrow, you can do that too. But I'll leave Thank it up to you. Scott. Let's hear it, Scott. What do you got? I once knew a man named Lorenzo. Last name came like mine, only spelled differently. No <laughs> E. So I went to the store for the first time in two, three years, walked on over to the bakery counter and said to the young man, hello, sir, I'd like a scone with blueberries. He said to me, yes, sir, and how would you like that scone? I gave him a little sideways look because everybody knows by now how Michael Caine likes his scones. I said to him, I'll take it the same way I take my toast. But <laughs> he said to me, no, sir, I'm afraid that's impossible. I said to him, well, then, I'll just take some toast, buttery. He said to me, no, sir, you misunderstand me. It's not the scone that's the problem. It's the buttery. I said to him, now, how can it be possible for a bakery not to offer bread that's buttery? He said to me, well, sir, the young man we hired to butter our bread has taken an early retirement. I said to him, well, sir. Do you have anything else? He said to me, I do have some rye to sell. So ends the travails of the young pitcher named Ty Pottery. Oh, my God. <laughs> I just had to show you that before. <laughs> that's good. That's that's quality humor right there. I appreciate that. That's, I can't believe you didn't show that to me earlier, David. Wow. No, I, I know th I, they're a good pie. I'd been listening for a long time, but I was like, man, if we ever get Ty on, I was like, I got to show him that. So at least he knows about it. That's funny, man. That was good. Uh, well, Ty, we thank you so much for taking some time to talk with us. Um, I think you brought attention to something that really needs to be talked more about. And, you know, we hope that that hopefully more people start talking about this because it's something that needs to be addressed. And I don't think it's something that should be down the road, I think it's something that needs to be addressed ASAP. Um, but before we get out of here, is there anything that you want to plug, you know, where they can find you, anything about Drip Social, anything that you'd like to plug to our audience? Um, yes, uh, dripsocial.inc. If you guys follow me, I'm sure you've been seeing me blast my story and my page. He's on Clubhouse. Yeah, I'm on. That's actually something I do want to plug. Drip Social, I want to stay, stick. That's kind of a you know Sam and I's own little crazy thing we got going on. I do want to stick a baseball relevant. So, um, you know, I had some, I had some obviously some strong feelings about baseball in that letter. You know, talking about everyone knows saying how I didn't love the game. I did it for other people. You know, I'm talking about MLB and the things they could do wrong. I want to make sure that people still can come and learn and see some learn something ask me questions about the game i'm not here i'm not the you know the bear you know the evil guy that's shitting on baseball 24 7 like i spent my life playing this game i have plenty i have tons of experiences i have tons of coaches i have tons of knowledge that i have been waiting until i kind of get some things going but that's what i'm doing on clubhouse so clubhouse it's actually the behind the lights. That's what my wife started. Um, it's more of a sports related uh, company and brand. And so we get on Clubhouse and I want kids and I want parents to, you know, join there every Thursday, eight o'clock Eastern. Come on. And like, literally, like I have my coaches that help me get to the MLB. My dad, my high school coach, my pitching coach, my hitting coach, um, my best friend who competed against me, my wife who was there through it all, my mom. And like, it's an open platform. Any kid, any parent that wants to ask a specific question, we will give you guys an answer and we'll give you, you know, a whole thing. So Clubhouse, it's uh, download the app, come on, join. We're going to be talking. And it's like, it's transparent talk. Like, it's not like it's just, it's real. It's authentic. It's to the point. It's unfiltered. Um, so yeah, we got that going on Clubhouse. So 
you guys can find that on my Instagram profile page. So please come out, join the room, 8 p.m. every Thursday. And make sure you're following him on Instagram. It's at Ty Butchery, his name exactly spelled out. He only has 7,500 followers right now, so we definitely got to get, get that up. out there. Got to get so him up. Yeah, we got to get him to 100K. 100K. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, guys. Hey, and, and you're the best, man. We appreciate you coming back. Um, you know, anytime that when you want to talk.